Jenkins Alp runs a construction and property development business in northern Cyprus. Here he shows us his latest project, 23 villas on the outskirts of Nicosia, Cyprus's divided capital. Nobody can uh, imagine this. Uh, it was a fully empty area here before 10 years. But now it is all under construction, very fast. All of the homes have been sold mostly to Turkish Cypriot families or mainland Turks. Testimony to an economic boom, thanks in large part to Turkey, which subsidizes the northern Cypriot economy to the tune of 3 billion Turkish lira, or over 1 billion euros per year. But for this Turkish Cypriot, there's no gloating when it comes to the crisis in the south. We don't feel good, because when you have a fire in your neighbor, at the end it will affect you. Uh, we feel very sorry about our neighbors, our brothers, because we share the same country, we share the same life since uh, centuries. But almost 40 years ago, this sharing stopped. In 1974, Turkish troops landed in the north to stop a military coup aimed at uniting Cyprus with Greece. Nine years later, the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus declared independence, an independence only recognized by Turkey. In 2004, an internationally brokered referendum to unite Cyprus was rejected by the South, which went on to prosper as an EU member. Ironically, it's the North's isolation which has shielded it from the banking crisis in the South. We are not hit by this uh, specific crisis because we are not in the Eurozone and we don't use Euro. We have other kinds of difficulties because we are not recognized uh, we don't have direct flights. We are under embargoes, isolations, uh, and for that reason, of course, life is tougher for us. But uh, one advantage that we have in this particular uh, period, we have a much stronger motherland, Turkey. But in southern Cyprus, it's the exposure to their so-called motherland, Greece's toxic banks, which led Cyprus last month to be the fifth EU member to get an EU IMF bailout. A bailout met with anger and frustration by Greek Cypriots who claimed their savings and livelihood were being sacrificed to save the banks in the euro. And to make matters worse, in mid-April, Cyprus announced the cost of its EU IMF bailout was now 23 billion euros, more than double the original estimation. Stelios Platis runs a financial services company. He's also a former advisor to the Cypriot president. For him, there's little faith in the economic decisions of the EU. The European Union tried to make an example out of Cyprus. They do not want a financial services sector which is based on efficient tax structures to appear in the European Union. Fair enough. Give us a mandate. Give us a time period. Two years, three years, four years, five years. And we will wind it down without the social cost without destroying more than a quarter of the economy and without taking a people, a whole people, out of economic prosperity for absolutely no reason. Finding solutions to replace one quarter of Cyprus's economy. One option which the government has approved is legalizing casinos which only exist in the north. Michalis Dimiotis manages a hotel chain in Cyprus. He believes casinos could greatly help the tourism sector, Cyprus's main breadwinner after the financial services. It doesn't necessarily have to be just a gambling venue. It can be a place where all the family can spend the day with nice restaurants, with uh, shows, and so many things taking place. Especially for source markets like uh, Israel, uh, the Middle East, and Russia would help a lot. Russia has banned uh, the casinos from all the major cities. So a lot of people would come to Cyprus from Russia, which is just uh, two and a half, three hours uh, flight just for this. While casinos will no doubt add revenue, critics argue it won't be enough to get Cyprus back on its economic feet, an economy that even before the banking crisis was hit hard by the property bubble. Adam and Yanni Lomas bought a home here six years ago. They finished it themselves after the developer went bankrupt. 
But now they're facing banks who want to collect mortgages the developer took on the property before going bankrupt. Despite this nightmare scenario, Adam, a retired oil engineer, says he believes in Cyprus, but the answer doesn't lie in financial services. We want to be part of the Cypriot dream, you know. And I know that the only way to do that now is this gift which is sitting out there, you know, and there's, there's gas out there, you know. We are absolutely sure that we don't know exactly how much, but we know there's gas out there. But we need a plan. Unless we have a very clear plan, it will not be possible for international investors, which are critical to make this work, unless there's a stable legal framework and a very clear national energy plan, no one will come near Cyprus. And, and it's got worse because the reputation of Cyprus, now no one's listening to us. We're, you know, Cyprus is the bad boy of Europe. We're the whipping boy. At stake in Cyprus's gas venture is money and geography. It's estimated it would be five times more expensive to transport the potential gas through southern Cyprus and Europe than to transport it through the north and a pipeline in Turkey. For the TRNC, it's an offer they've made not once, but twice. Uh, we repeated that offer in 2012 by adding a new element to it, and that is the exportation of these uh, uh, fines uh, via northern Cyprus and via Turkey which is the most profitable way and perhaps the best way uh, to uh, benefit uh, from these uh, natural resources which everyone says belong to both communities. We think that doing it jointly and benefiting from this jointly would uh, be the way out uh, of the economic problems or also of the political problem. But even if this proposal could solve Cyprus's problems, it would mean negotiating with Turkey, a country still seen by the South as an occupier of their land. I've tried to explain to people who would be able to make this decision that there are more options than just an LNG plant. Unfortunately, one of those options involves reaching agreement with our neighbours in the North. And that is such an emotional subject here. You can't go into a single coffee shop or cafe in any part of southern Cyprus without feeling the hurt of people's sons who were lost in the conflict. There's little doubt that emotions still run high in a country haunted by a conflict which killed thousands and displaced both Turkish and Greek Cypriots. Few want to talk about it in front of the camera, and those who will talk admit the crisis has stacked the cards against them. The negotiation should be held at a time when both parties are on equal footing, and I don't feel that right now is the time for us. Of course, of course that does not mean that a solution is not desirable. Of course, it would solve a lot of problems, even, even the financial problems we are facing now, but we shouldn't sacrifice uh, a fair and just uh, solution for a uh, quick solution. Finding a fair and just solution to one of Europe's oldest conflicts. In this current landscape of a Eurozone crisis plagued with austerity and budget cuts, the concern is that time could also become a growing deficit.